we've been discussing and, and talking about gathering information and carcass data. And, and uh, actually today we have some meetings at Kansas State, so it kind of reminds me of a sports analogy. When we, uh, I went to a ball game with my boys in the past year and I saw the, the athletes going like this and, and I'm not very cool, so I'm like, what's that all about? And they go, oh, come on, Dad, they mean feed me, feed me, give me more, give me more. And, and that made me think a little bit about, uh, you know, our search to, to make the very best Angus cattle for the beef business that we can possibly do. And, and in that search, our, our goal and our objective is to have this predictive information that lets us hit the targets of merit. And so what we've learned as we've worked through uh, this group of sire evaluation cattle as we validate our young bulls up against the proven bulls, I think it's very, very exciting to see at this point in time we've harvested about 135 of the 100 and 65 cattle that we've had on feed. There'll be one more group of cattle that'll go next week. So our data is evolving on these young bulls, but uh, at the same time, uh, we're seeing a trend. And uh, I, you know, people ask me, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? And, and uh, what I believe, what I see is, uh, is information coming in that allows us to make decisions as we go forward. We, we hoped some of these things would be true three months ago, and as we visited in some of the other discussions uh, about genomics and EPDs, uh, these have very, very high correlations, but we still have to validate these bulls with the phenotypes. And so as we look at that and, and what we believe to be true three months ago uh, today, uh, we much more know what to be true. And so as we review some of the young sires that were a part of this validation project uh, on sire evaluation, uh, the young bulls we were testing were Advance, Early Bird, Deer Valley All In, Momentum, and uh, to a lesser degree, uh, just a little more data on anticipation and composure in some of those bulls that didn't have quite as much kill data. And I think what's exciting for us is uh, this stuff works. And it works very, very well. And so uh, we expected these bulls to be good. Are there differences? Yes. Uh, can they compete? Yes. And, and so I'm just going to go through, and, and much like I would when I'm trying to make decisions in, in mating our cow herd for our customers, let's just do a sort on these cattle. And let's say I want bulls that are 0.48 uh, accuracy. You're going to have to have at least seven carcasses on record to have that. And uh, that's advance at this point, and, and advance... Uh, has the least carcass data of all of them that we're, we're going to talk about today. The reason for that was we got the semen very late in the year, and so uh, there'll be five more steers coming in. But when you look at advance and, and that 0.48 for, for the minimum amount of uh, data that we want to take a look at, and we do a sort of the American Angus Association sire evaluation report, and uh, again, I would implore our colleagues in the business that that we need more data and, and we're happy to contribute our part but I would encourage our colleagues to to get more data. There's only 70 bulls in the entire Angus sire evaluation report with a 0.48 accuracy with seven carcasses or more um, that make that sort. And let's add into that equation, you know, I'm requested a lot by our customers, you know, we want to be multi-trait specialists and you know, when I was growing up, we all thought marbling was the, uh, the key to carcass success. But really, when you're talking about British cattle, Angus cattle in general, um, we probably have more of an issue with muscle than we do with marbling. We need to improve both. But so let's just be a little more sophisticated. Let's make a sort for having cattle that are plus one or greater for marbling and plus one or greater for ribeye with that 0.48 accuracy and now we're down to 10 bulls. And I think the exciting thing for us as we look at these cattle and we look at uh, identifying new sires to help us have a greater chance at profitability, three of the young sires uh, have joined that group of 10 bulls. But when we look at Advance and we look at his calving ease, he's not a high growth bull, but what he does do is he excels for, for marbling. In fact, uh, today, and he needs much, much more validation. He and Early Bird 
um, are tied for second amongst all Angus bulls in the Angus breed for marbling at 1.73. Uh, the only bull higher than him is the reference sire in this, this database, one of the reference sires, and that's Progress. And Progress uh, is still the highest bull of all time, uh, identified bull at 1.79. And at this point in time, he has 129 steers on record uh, that have been harvested and and those cattle uh, you know are elite for marbling and uh, that gives him a 0.8 accuracy for marbling but when you look at advanced and you look at his ability to have calving ease uh, you know and, and oftentimes we talk about getting paid with pounds and we pounds pay the bills but it's the value of those pounds and advance has a great deal of, of value when you look at his uh, 1.73 marbling and his 1.01 .01 ribeye. He actually also has a lot of carcass weight ranking in the top 15 percent of the breed uh, at this point in time with a, a 48 carcass weight. When you when you move on down to early bird who actually tied with advance uh, early bird is also at 1.73 for marbling. Uh, his carcass weight has actually fallen off a little bit. Uh, at one point in time he was about a 45 for carcass weight and uh, he has fallen to a 33 for carcass weight so that has reduced uh, some of his index numbers especially for the dollar beef because that weighting is you know pounds do pay the bills and so at this point in time with 15 carcasses early bird uh, is showing up with 33 pounds of carcass weight but he is the second highest bull of all time for marbling so uh, as with advance as with progress uh, about 50% of all of the carcasses we've harvested so far have reached the prime grade, which for a, a reference to the average cattle going through national beef at the same time, uh, as these cattle went through, plant average was about 4%. So again, when you look at early bird and you look at the possibility to create cattle that uh, have calving ease, um, you know, a little higher growth bull than advance as he uh, as he's 102 for yearling weight, and that, you know, that's not especially high, but it's still top 25% of the breed. And when we look at his stature, um, he's breed average for yearling hip height, so he's certainly not out of bounds. And when we look at his ribeye, uh, at this point in time with 15 carcasses, um, you know, he ranks in the top 10%, which is certainly nothing to be uh, ashamed of, top 10% at a .86 for ribeye. Again, we need more data but we do know these cattle uh, will have quality grade and they'll have some muscle to it. Uh, we'll drop on down to another bull that was tested in this group and that's the Surefire bull. Uh, Surefire sired by Keneally and Sure out of a 50-50 on back to one of my all-time favorite uh, sires of Gridmaker. And I think again the exciting thing is that we have Cavinese uh, in the you know the top three percent of the Angus breed for Cavinese with a lot of growth too in the top 15 percent both for weaning and yearling weight. And so I, I would look at Surefire and what we've seen with the data we've submitted is um, he's kind of a 50-50 type for docility. Uh, his 33 score puts him in the top 1 percent of the Angus breed. And on record today there are 38 animals that have had data submitted for docility. So we need to, to measure some more but we do think that Surefire is significantly uh, tamer. I think the exciting thing for Surefire ends up being just his total appeal across the board. Uh, he's top 20% for carcass weight at 43. He's a 1.32 for marbling. Uh, that's top 1%. And he's one of those 10 bulls that, that are known. There's more bulls out there that uh, probably have plus one and plus one for ribeye and marbling, but they're not identified. So how do we know how to use them or who to use if we don't know who they are? And, uh, you know, when you look at uh, Surefire's ribeye, he's top 2% at plus 1.04 with 27 carcasses. And so I think it's extremely exciting to have a bull with that kind of calving ease, that kind of growth, um, and just that kind of appeal for all of the traits. Probably the shining star of the whole test has been momentum. Momentum is also in that top 3% of the breed for calving ease. Uh, top 10% for yearling growth. You know, it's exciting to me that he's actually in the bottom 35% of the breed for stature uh, when you look at his yearling hip height EPD. And, you know, it's awfully exciting 
you know, we've got to get them pregnant and it's a lowly heritable trade, but for heifer pregnancy, um, it's a very, very important trade and today, momentum ranks in the top 15% of the breed for, for his heifer pregnancy. So as we get to the, the point of the carcass test and the carcass evaluation, momentum's the top 10% of the breed for carcass weight. He's a 1.48 for, for marbling, that's top 1%. He's a 1.13 for ribeye. That's top 1%. He's one of the good bulls that we've identified in many, many years. And, you know, we are at Kansas State University today, and that's where a lot of us got our education, and I'm sure you all been exposed to education many different ways. But this is just like math. It does work. And if if we apply it and we make the selections and, and if I look at momentum or surefire and all these cattle, you know, they go back to the cattle that we were working with when I was in high school in the late seventies, uh, even in college in the early eighties. And it's additive. And when you add genomics into this and you add those predictive natures, you know, the genomics give us a point six to point seven correlation for the various traits with the phenotypes. But again, I would ask our colleagues and ask those in the business today to realize even with those kind of correlations, we still have to validate. You know, in all honesty, I'm just gonna take two progress half brothers, advance and momentum. You know, advance is a massive bull. He's a very high volume, wide base, big footed bull. He's an older bull than momentum was. Uh, so everybody pretty much expected advance to put a whooping on momentum. But sometimes our eyes aren't the same as, as, uh, as the reality. And when you get down to it on a type and kind, uh, visual appraisal, advance and momentum are very, very similar. But when I look at a bull that I can have breed leading cavities, early growth, bottom 35% stature, top 15% heifer pregnancy, upper percentile carcass weight. Those are the pounds, those are the direct measurements that we get paid for. And the top 1% for marbling, the taste fat, not the waste fat, but the taste fat. Breed leading ribeye, you know, Angus cattle, British cattle need muscle. It's really, really exciting. So we've gone from four months ago when we made the first video about gathering this data to now we look at this and we realize that these are bulls for the future for us to go forward. And Momentum and Surefire are two of our high use bulls. When we look at those bulls that are one and one for ribeye and marbling, a couple of the reference sires, Anticipation and Sunrise, continue to prove that they are what they are. And so, as we talked about earlier, did you play in the NFL or did you play at Ashland Junior High School? Momentum Advance, Early Bird, Surefire, went up against Sunrise, Profit, Progress, Ingenuity, and they competed and they competed very well. That's opportunity, that's excitement, that's validation. And so, when we try to discover what these traits are, you know, I, I get calls every day. What do you think about this bull? What do you think about that bull? And again, in the, in the search and the quest for knowledge and information, I have to tell the truth. I don't know because the data is not there. Everything that we see looks okay on a lot of these young sires that people ask about. And oftentimes, you know, I hear, well, the gardener's bulls did this or they did that. They changed a little bit. They do because we submit the data. And I am proud to use the best bull of the Angus breed if I know who he is, but he has to be proven. And so when I look at what our job is on these young sires, it's to validate them, to prove them, to compare them to the very best bulls of the Angus breed. And ultimately, it's to multiply the best ones. This stuff works. It works very, very well.
carcass traits, growth traits, stature traits, are extremely high heritability. I encourage you to submit more data. I encourage you to multiply the best ones.